you very much, Mr. Guimard. Good afternoon, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like first to thank uh, Sim Staffatarab and Thierry de Montbrial for giving me the pleasure to share with this prestigious audience, albeit thinning across the days, a few ideas. And first of all, respond to Thierry's opening address invitation to us all uh, to consider all forms of common goods to humankind. Indeed, what is more common good to humankind than the human dimension itself? So my challenge would be, first of all, to keep you awake after three days of intense debates, and second, to try to make it on the light side, because so many ideas have been exchanged, but on the light side for very, very serious themes. So this would be rather difficult. Knowing that indeed the legitimate question would be rather what place, where is humanity in the global governance? What place for the human dimension when inflicted extreme suffering is probably the most common shared reality across the world? When the rise of violence in international politics, which is of course the daily bread of certain regimes and of criminal and uh, illegal networks, but unfortunately, which are invading as well the practice of some, which is really, really frightening because they're supposed on the contrary to be the guardian of the rule of law and they are lecturing the rest of the world of that while the illegal, uh, the tide, illiberal, on the two sides of the Atlantic is gaining ground and threatening the very basic values of democracy and human rights that the Western powers have been endeavoring to impose to the rest of the world for over a century. So my problem is as well another question is that liberalism will have to seriously reinvent itself or it might collapse. So the question, which is mighty and it has been hinted to, what type of governance are we going to see after 2049, where the rise in China will be probably finishing the construction of new norms that probably it would like to share or to impose on the rest of the world? But before that really prospects, we have as well to consider where is the place of humanity and what is the role of the human dimension in front of the main two threats, the potential breakdown of the ecological and environment status and the technological disruption with all the implied risks. So of course we have some good news because we are told that the potential massive destructions of jobs by technological change would not be extremely damaging because it will create new jobs. And the assumption is that in the developed countries, which are using already robots and artificial intelligence, the rate of unemployment is very is not high. On the contrary, it's probably the lowest. Yes, but what about the cohort of all the rest of the nations who do not have this advantage of the advanced technology? What does that mean? It means that disruptions will be created by the rising inequalities and disparities, even much more than they are now. This is the first, probably, consequence, leading perhaps to a frightening prospect which might be the digital refugees which will come and overburden the existing very complex problematic of migration and refugees. I will come afterward you know, to that problem very briefly. So the second scaring element is of course the decrease in trust in science 
and technology to be able to provide all the answers to our mighty challenges. So this trend is absolutely devastating for, of course, R&D and investment. And I'm particularly concerned for Africa, where we badly need still R&D and investment to address and find mainly the security, uh, the food security, the sustainable development, and beyond the transformation of the continent in line with Agenda 2063. I'm just emerging from a week on higher education in Nairobi. And I have some hope because I have seen that Africa is really embarking on doing its homework in line with what Prime Minister from Ethiopia told us at lunchtime. But still, the, uh, despite the repath that Lionel Zansou has mentioned, I'm extremely concerned about brain drain and how you can train and prepare all this human capital and answer the expectations of all the youth in Africa, which are really immense and where, unfortunately, brain drain in a country like Morocco is still extremely concerning. I'm happy that my country and OCP are part of this endeavor for the transformation of Africa, <coughs> as we have been hearing yesterday in the workshop about Africa. Second, addressing the impact of climate change and environmental deterioration is, of course, an extremely mighty endeavor that we are just starting to grasp. And there is some kind of awareness about that, of course, the uh, work should be tremendous and taken uh, in place collectively. However, we have some kind of help beyond the mushrooming initiatives, for instance, to clean the plastic oceans. We have an initiative around the uh, Indian Ocean by 40 countries led by South Africa about a blue economy. And we do know how promising the potential of oceans is great for the survival of humanity. So the migration I had hinted to, and which was discussed yesterday in the panel about migration and multiculturalism, only unfortunately to ignore the second equation, the second component of the equation, and to bring in no solutions, allow me to address it in a totally different manner. Linking migration, identities and the diaspora. Just to remind us all of a few obvious facts and developments which some refuse to take into account, especially those who are in denial of the basic changing realities and trends of our own societies incapable of inventing the future, they do take refuge in the past within their closed frontier. So let me just quote three of these realities. Migration and mobility are on the rise. They're not going to stop. On the contrary, they're going to increase, including because of the development of Africa. Because the youngs will seek better jobs, better opportunities, and you will see a lot more of migration. So we do have to organize ourselves to address all of us this problem between sending transit and receiving countries, and you do know that my country is becoming these three all together. Second, we do observe that emerging identities made of hybridation and cross-fertilizing are really far from the myth and illusion of pure races are really becoming the majority. And the third, is that the tremendous benefit that we can derive, all of us, from this uh, trend in order to capitalize on the wealth of our diversity and different culture. And Carlos Gunn has given us the illustration yesterday of that. So let me give just a few examples about this, which nurture this hope, the aspiration of the common benefit far from the caricatures which want to contain migrants into criminals, terrorists, or whatever. The first example 
And you allow me to say it in French, because we share this happy news with France. It's about Rachid Graoui, qui, comme vous le savez, est professeur de l'algorithme réparti et qui vient d'être élu au Collège de France et qui a fait sa leçon inaugurale jeudi 25 avril sur algorithme à la recherche de l'universalité perdue. Ce jeune professeur à l'école polytechnique de Lausanne et qui a déjà aussi enseigné à MIT, évidemment, a fait partager son universalité à tous les Marocains sur les réseaux sociaux. Le second exemple est aussi fourni par le beau sourire d'une femme marocaine aussi, Ilham Qadri, qui a été portée à la tête du groupe Solvay, le plus grand groupe chimiste au monde, et qui, évidemment, offre un exemple absolument emblématique à la fois aux femmes et aux Méditerranéens du Sud que nous sommes. Donc, bien sûr, une hirondelle ne fait pas le printemps, mais il me semble que ce, ces deux exemples tout à fait emblématiques viennent à bout des préjugés et des caricatures qu'on veut nous faire avaler. So last but not least, allow me to make this transition about women issues in order to finish on a very happy note. Of course, I will have to deplore first that 50 conservative American senators have elected on the 6th of October Kavanaugh to the temple of law protection, the Supreme Court of America, at the uh, expense, of course, of the heavy allegation of sexual assault and at about his own testimony, and totally deaf to the roar of the Me Too, who millions of American women were expressing. So, of course, this is really a very dismal evolution, and I'm absolutely uh, repelled, like many Americans, by this move. However, however, we do have a very, very positive answer to this problem through the attribution of the Nobel Prize to two personalities, two of them from the third world. Nadia Murad, a 25-year Yezidi Iraqi girl, who is the survivor of the ordeals that Daesh has been imposing on her, and her testimony is absolutely devastating. But with courage, she has been witnessing to make sure that for the human memory, this is not overlooked. And the second is the surgeon from Congo, you have all, of course, all heard of, Denis Mukwege in Hospital Bukavo, who has remained in his country to repair the raped women and little girls from the savage ordeals, once again, of sexual violence used for conflicts. So, through these two examples, I think that we have here the reward of humanity being still worth being fight being really uh, fought for in order to become and prevail as the real value and our common shared value. Thank you for your attention. And so I do hope that we need a new narrative because of course in the Mediterranean, which is torn apart, whether be it within the societies north and south or between the two rims, we do need, I think, a new utopia. And I would very much, with Harari as well, encourage a new faction for sapiens to make sure that we can still survive in our planet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.